Big Questions with the Dead Milkman. Welcome <laughs> to Big Questions with the Dead Milkman. You may notice that there's a fifth person here. It's we have a guest <laughs> today, and his name is Dan Mapp. Um, he was our tour manager for the Dead Milkman. Uh, starting in 1987, all the way up until we quit touring, um, still. and we still we still <laughs> go out on a, on jaunts every now and then. And Dan comes with us as a tour manager if he's available. You you might uh, recognize him from the uh, cover of Chaos Rules, no live at the Trocadero by the Dead Milkmen. And he was not only our tour manager, but he was also our sound engineer for our live shows. Um, like I said, he started in 1987 uh, when we went on tour for the album Bucky Fellini. Prior to that, we didn't have, we had a, uh, our manager came out with us on the road, Dave Reckner. He acted as our tour manager and our sound guy and our regular old manager. But by 1987, uh, he... He got tired of us. He, he got, he, he couldn't, he couldn't... Everybody at home just waiting to now. find out what happened. <laughs> he asked <laughs> Dan Mapp. And I, the backstory is Dan Mapp went to college with Dave Reckner and me. He was actually my roommate for uh, one whole year of... College at Temple University. So that's the backstory. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm going to start off with a few questions and we're going to go around and ask Dan some questions so you'll get to know a little more about what he does and what maybe what a tour manager does in case you don't even know that. Um, so, Dan, how did, why did you uh, accept Dave Reckner's? I know Dave Reckner asked you and <laughs> to, to be well, our tour manager and this is a I had been why, a why sales, did you accept this? <laughs> I had been a sales manager with a cable TV company living in such luxurious places as Marquette, Michigan and down in uh, South Carolina and outside of St. Louis and I'd kind of gotten tired of traveling like that and okay. when he asked it was really the perfect time because uh, somebody, when I lived, it was across from the town that uh, James Brown lived in. They said, "You know, you can't really work here after dark." <laughs> and uh, what? Where was that? I won't name the city. Okay. But it, it also happened in Granite City, Illinois, when I was in cable, and I I did open up a cable office there, and uh, I lived. So, but no, I, was... I think the people in uh, uh, Georgia were a little bit more serious about it. But uh, but no, it was a good time to take the job, and it was a great opportunity, and it really opened up the world to me. And you know, I could tour manage, do sound, sell merch, and drive around the yeah. America. You know, yeah. it was a good time. Now, do I remember Dan that um, well? You had a band, um, and didn't you play the show that we played? The first show that the Milkman played, yeah, called the Singles with Dave Herzog. Dave Herzog on drums. Yeah, he's a uh, college professor, and he played drums in a band that played with the Dead Milkman and uh, Mr. Happy <laughs> with John <Yeah>. Worcester <laughs> in Harleysville at the Harleysville Youth Center. <laughs> was so, good time. so we had already met up. The whole band knew who you were, and and not only that, um, you came to our first show in where was it, Wisconsin or Milwaukee? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was living in. Uh, Southern Illinois at that point, and two guys I worked with, two friends, we drove up, saw you in Wisconsin and Chicago. Right. So um, that's that's how Dan became our tour manager. Um, and he didn't, I guess he, why did you continue to be our tour manager after our first, <laughs> after the first tour with us? That's another question I always wondered. <laughs> That was good times, please. There's nothing okay, else like it. Hanging out with your friends, seeing, uh, seeing the and By world. that time, we also had, we were, we employed a full-time roadie, too. Our first couple of tours was just the five, five people, but 
we had six people because we had our uh, Jeff Fox and then um, Dave, Dave's brother Joe came out with us. And Lee Wolf. Lee Wolf came Lee in. Lee Wolf. And, Thanksgiving and, at Mojo Nixon's with Lee Wolf. Oh, yeah. And uh, everybody Matt Dubin. Are, of Matt Dubin, of course. Oh, yeah. Well, then. Great Matt, Matt Dubin. Matt with us, was with us for several years. Yes, who left a very fine, prestigious college to be on the road with us. Yeah, you, <laughs> you did have some uh, experience with uh, sound engineering, but as far as I know, no experience with managing a band, but you learned the ropes quickly. What 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 were your duties, basically? Uh, you, there's a booking agent that books the tour, then you get the contract and contacts and set everything else up in terms of travel, hotels, the schedule for the day, making sure you're treated properly, making sure you get paid properly, which sometimes works out and sometimes it's questionable. And then making sure you get to the hotel and to the next show. <laughs> and once you guys got out of the van and into a bus, dealing with that stuff, and then all different kinds of permutations of everything, dealing with the label sometimes, which back then meant having a yellow piece of paper and a bunch of quarters so you can make <laughs> phone calls and let you do interviews. And everything. <laughs> right. They, cell phones existed, but they were really way too expensive for anyone. Big and expensive, use. yeah. Dan Stevens, do you have a question? Because Joe and Dean jumped way the shit over here. <laughs> <laughs> Am I in the order? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I know. They, they, they got close, though. And that, good for them. Uh, yeah, I do have a question. A few, uh, but I'll start with this one. Has there ever been a time where you thought you didn't want to do this anymore? Because I know you travel a lot and then the pandemic happened and then was there ever a point where you were like, maybe I want to do something else? Well, the pandemic gave me a big break. Uh, you know, they kept saying, oh, you kept rescheduling stuff and doing stuff. I mean, basically I've always held that I'll do it and I want to stop before I don't want to do it. I don't want to ever hate it yeah. per se, but I still enjoy working whether it's in America, Europe, Japan, Australia, wherever. I still enjoy working everywhere. And just there's interesting people in places. So I, I still enjoy it. But there, I mean, there are times I, I will say that I was setting up a, this sounds weird, but I was selling. I was going to do a Nora Jones tour at the same time as I was setting up a Dean Ween group tour in Australia and doing setting those both up at the same time. And they were starting exact. I was ending a Ween tour and working on the Nora Jones thing and trying to make sure that was all done right. I was sometimes thinking maybe I have too much on my plate, but it didn't mean I didn't want to do it. It just meant that there was maybe too much on my plate. But it all got done. But. I, I've got a question. Yeah. In, in 2010, the Chicago Reader ran a series of pavement tour diaries. Oh, yeah. Good times. I, I read it. religiously because they had very little to do with pavement and everything to do with you. Your name appeared in it more than the name of the band. So I have a question. This was in the tour diary. And I've never, I know you and I are oftentimes sitting up front in the van late at night talking about movies and, and stuff, but I've been meaning to ask this for a while. So I'm going to read the quote. Oh no. <laughs> Here it is. Dan Math is tour managing both bands. Dan will have the hardest job in show business when he submits the guest list for the Pavement Sonic Youth Show at the Hollywood Bowl this September. <laughs> What was the deal with that guest list? Why, was it, like, how big was it? What was it actually a problem? Was the guy from Pavement wrong? I, I, I have so many questions. He knew it was going to be big. He knew it was going to be over probably two hundred people, and that there would be a private party afterwards that more people would want to go to than we could allow to go. And uh, it was actually a great time. I mean, it's the Hollywood Bowl with those guys. It was. Pretty amazing, but he kind of knew what he was talking about. <laughs> no, it was. It was. When you did you like turn in, did you leave the guest list and run, or did you turn it in like this? Or how? Don't hate me. 
a pair of tongs or something. <laughs> it's radioactive. <laughs> that happened a couple times when I was trying to do two bands at once. That show, and there was a festival in Denver where I was doing, wait, it was, no, it was Sleater, Kinney, and Ween. And I had to take one off and put the other on because I was doing both on the same day. But mm. things happen. But the Hollywood Bowl is because it's L.A. It's L.A., yeah. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> You're wonderful, sweetheart. You're wonderful. <laughs> yeah, Dan, Dan's gone out. You've gone out with lots of, you've tour managed dozens of bands maybe more than that I don't you know. keep a list and you know how many different but, bands you've been out with i do not know there was quite a few in the 90s and still quite a few in the 2000s because i would work with super chunk back in the 90s but then around 2000 and then last june i went out with them again and everything and you worked and with a bunch there's of a lot of i mean there's six bands alone from new zealand that i worked with Wow. And most That's people the entire don't know population people. in New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> most people don't know, but I had a great time with them. But most people would say, wait, band from New Zealand. But Any yeah, sheep I, come on tour? <laughs> huh? Any sheep come on tour from New Zealand? <laughs> Was that the guy who would do the impression of the Americans? The, the New Zealand guy who would go like Big Mac, large fries or something? <laughs> oh, the little kids. Oh. They had their three-year-olds on the ro road, and they would do an impression. Rose and Brighty would do the, an impersonation of an American. You want fries with that? <laughs> and, oh, harshed by a three-year-old. <laughs> I know. It was amazing. But then, uh, incredibly, when the monkeys were in Australia a couple of years ago, uh, I got to see them. It was really crazy. Grown up, you know. Oh, the kids, yeah. <laughs> yeah, folks, Dan got to tour with the monkeys. We're all in all of him. <laughs> It was good times. It was good for you guys to actually get to meet and oh yeah, and everything. So, how do you go from from touring with Super Chunk to touring with the Monkeys? What what is the <laughs> process there? It's a long indirect <laughs> line, but, <laughs> but strangely, the uh, the lighting person for Pavement from that 2010 tour recommended me to the Monkeys. I should have real. I, I don't care about it. They had fired about six tour managers <laughs> uh, before they even got on the road for one tour. And so I, they got to me. So she recommended me and luckily it worked out. So I got to do them for uh, quite a while. It's cool. And do the Michael Nesmith solo tours that I got to do with because of that. And the first national band was all really because of... <laughs> Is that how people hire you through word of mouth, or do you have uh, uh, an agency? And do you have an agent that gets you your tour manager? Did no, I kind of was happy to just work word of mouth since way back. Never, I shouldn't say this because it is a good idea to have a card, but I never even made a card. I just figured if somebody contacted me, that means they were interested, and. We work out the details after that. Who, yeah, it's who all been the, word of mouth. Do you remember who was the first act you went out after you were, while we were winding our touring down? Oh, yeah. That was a good one because you were in the studio recording in Austin. Uh -huh. And Mike Stewart was managing a band called Port Off Pondering. Oh, yeah. And they were going to Europe. And he says, oh, you're a good tour manager. Can you take them to Europe? And I had never been there, but I said, of course. <laughs> and I started calling people, which is what you do. If you take a job you don't know, you just call people you know who are good at it and ask them what you need to do. And luckily it was on back on CBS slash Sony Records. So they had a good budget. And we went, the first time we went, we were on this huge thing. We were in the same hotel with Eric Clapton and seeing all these people. We ran into him at the American Hotel in Amsterdam. And then we went back again and it wasn't quite the same. But <laughs> when the late, you know, when you're on, but it was really poured off pondering was the first uh, time I went to Europe just because uh, you guys were recording a record yeah. and that led to my you next. You beat us there. Yeah. Didn't you do a bunch of metal bands then? 
Oh, yeah, but we don't talk about that period. No. Okay. Oh. There, there was a, like an 11 month period of Halford. Great. I was gone 11 months straight. Oh, I did. Doing you metal. With, uh, who we, were on, we were on uh, Ozfest. Oh, wow. And the bus we got, because the, the, the band's record hadn't even come out. We're on Ozfest, and they gave us a band that came off the Britney Spears tours that was wrapped in <laughs> Pikachu's. And at, at, on one date, you could see our pink bus with yellow Pikachu's <laughs> on the side of the stage while the band's on. And it's like everybody's buying black shirts and everything's black and dark and aggro. And there's a pink bus with yellow <laughs> Pikachu's on the side. But Island Def Jam was pushing, pushing the metal. So we got, we toured we with Seven that. Dust. We did a show with Metallica. We played with a whole bunch of bands and everything. But that was pretty wild. And then I said, okay, I did enough metal and rap metal. So. <laughs> are, there any acts you, metal. Are, there, are there any acts you turn down when they ask you if you want to do a tour? When I was younger, I turned down only once. And it wasn't really turning it down. Something I was like, I don't know if I can do George Benson at soccer stadiums in South America. <laughs> oh, okay. So I... I didn't even like really pursue it, but now I'm like I should have do I should have tried to do that. Does George Benson do the moonlighting theme? No, that's that's he does a whole bunch of stuff. But. Some walk by. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to do the moonlighting theme. <laughs> moonlighting strange. <laughs> that leads into a question I had, which was: Are there any artists that you would love to tour manage that you haven't yet? Um, I. This is a dumb thing. Uh, Sonic Youth did a bunch of stuff with Neil Young. And then we did a bridge school benefit with him. And at some point, a few years later, we were doing a festival in uh, Barcelona with him. And the crew comes up to me and goes, oh, we almost hired you. I was all like, oh, I don't want to know, know that. Neil Young? Tell me that I almost got hired by Neil Young, who I'd love yeah. to work with. But I did get to go to his house, and he did pass me a joint, and I I didn't take it, and I regret not taking it. <laughs> did, you didn't time, hear, you you hear that, young house, people. We were at the bonfire. <laughs> he was passing me the joint, and I was like, "Oh man, I should have just taken it." But but I was working. But right, <laughs> we were hanging out. But I was working. But I'm shocked because Neil seen nice. the needle and the damage done. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would never have guessed Neil would be smoking a joint either. We keep really nice. He was. We keep Dan. You keep. You want to jump in? You got. We keep. Yeah, yeah. I've got a couple. I've got a, a bunch of questions. Well, uh, you can't you, ask them. I was just. You ever, had to, uh, <laughs> you ever had to bail anybody out of jail? Yes, but I won't say who. I know who because I was around when it happened. Yeah, we, we were around when it happened. We, yes, the milkmen were around when it happened. Yeah, we, we we coughed up the money to get the person out. Yes, we called, yeah, yeah, we were part of that money. springing him. Yeah, <laughs> I baked a cake with a file in it. <laughs> yeah, so, I, here's another question: I'm Like bailing people out of jail, or the show in Oklahoma City where the promoter got arrested with the show's money? I actually talked the cops into giving us the money. Which I still don't know how that really worked because yeah. was that our show or is that somebody else's? Yeah, oh no, that was the Dead Milk show. show. The promoter yeah. was getting drunk and he heard some skinheads were gonna show up. So he carried a gun with him, but his pants were too loose. So he kept dropping the gun. <laughs> and then he got in a fight with somebody, and the cops came and arrested him. And I just, and I kind of talked to him calmly to the police and said, We kind of need the money to go to the next show, you know. And because he had the money on him. And the police were very nice and gave it to us. I, I was like, I didn't really think they were going to, but oh. I had to ask. <laughs> well, at another point, the police took our money and didn't give it back. <laughs> well, they well, almost took it in. We were um, held at gunpoint in Arizona. In Arizona, yep. Yeah, in Arizona, you had, you had to get the money back because you knew how much there was. And we yeah. were basically surrounded by... Was it 20 or 30 cops? One of them, I know. It was at least 20. Yeah, put a shotgun up in my head. Yeah. It was kind of ridiculous because 
they said they were looking for a brown man in a black van, but then they saw a black man in a brown van. I thought it was a white man in a blue van. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> They're not, that would have made more sense to me, but but once they saw us, they called everybody in. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, they, they it was were, kind they... of ridiculous that there were 20 cops for, for us, you know. And and that they let it go on for so long, and then just said, "Oh, you can go. No sorry, no, no nothing." Just no, no, he's he still on the TV hotel. or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember yeah, one cop had a gun on the TV, yeah. and I had my. They said, "Well, your printer looks like a TV." And I was, <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I remember the one had a shotgun when they were taking us out up to my head, and he was like, "Go ahead and run. Go ahead and run." I'm like. I'm too hungover to run. And all I kept thinking, I had one of the worst hangovers of my life the day that happened. And I kept thinking, if he pulls the trigger, he's just doing me a favor. <laughs> but yeah, that was a special yeah. Arizona day. I have a question. Um, it's a, it's a two-parter. Um, so I know this is going to be hard, but do you have a favorite city in the U.S. and maybe another one outside somewhere of the U.S.? Can you tell us about those favorite cities and why you like those? Well, I always enjoyed Austin because we spent so much time there. And um, I love L.A., but I love a lot of places. I love Portland, Seattle, Burlington, Vermont. We've had great times in Burlington, Vermont. Strangely, the at the broccoli. last month. Huh? With the screaming broccoli. Yes, I was actually, that's my story I was going to tell was that I was just, I was up there on the last monkeys tour and a couple of the crew guys, of course, they're local, were my age and was talking. And I brought up shows at Nectar's and Screaming Broccoli. They're like, how do you know about Screaming Broccoli? And I would sing some of their songs and they're like, how, how in the world? But, <laughs> but Screaming Broccoli was good times. But in terms of other cities, I, I love uh, Amsterdam. I love Berlin. Auckland, New Zealand, Sydney, Byron Bay. In terms of why I like them, Berlin just has a lot going on. Amsterdam's a good intro into Europe. It's old, it's new. Same in terms of like Montreal, it has old and new things that are great about it. And just the people in, in the, all those places. In Auckland, you can, I just found a piece of paper It had this surf shuttle I took there you can get from Auckland to a rainforest or like a, a a crazy, you know, tropical beach in less than an hour from the city or take ferries to all these different places, all these different islands, which, you know, one of the guys from Wien was married to a woman from one of Wahiki, I believe it was, and they threw them a big party. When I got to go there for Sonic Youth, and stay there for a while. And then the Weens tour started in Australia right after it. That would have been like 2008, which was pretty amazing to have extended time down there. Cool. My sister, I didn't even do an I didn't even do an Australian accent. How did that? Oh. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> the Kiwi accent is pretty hard to do. Oh, mm -hmm. I worked with the Datsuns. I know we say Datsuns, but they say Datsuns. Yeah. And. Uh, I was also on Ozfest with them. With the other story was with a different band, but the the Dodsons decided they were going to sell a bright red shirt, and we sold one. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't black because everybody wanted black shirts, but they said no. They should be there should be a bright shirt, and mm -hmm. and it was a good time. In case you're out hunting or walking along the sidewalk. <laughs> um, Hey, I, I got a question because we have a lot of people in bands that watch these shows. Uh, they watch this show. I don't know why anybody watches it, to be honest with you. Um, in fact, one of those bands had a pink tour bus and was on Ozfest. And it was crying. <laughs> um, all right, so here's the thing. Here's a question, though. Um, if what? Uh, well, first of all, I, I, no, I'm going to switch back. I'm going to go to another one. Save that one to list. But when you're doing sound, do you have people come up and and just give you terrible advice? Do they come up to you and go, oh, you should, the, the hi-hat needs to have some reverb on it and come up so it's louder than the guitar, you know what I'm saying? Or Every sound man gets the question, do you know what all those do? <laughs> then there's, you know, usually some relative of a band member. If, if it's a relative of a drummer, they want more drummer. The girlfriend of the guitar player wants more guitar, bass player. 
You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> what, the big player, what? No way. <laughs> sound check. Sound, sound check should be limited to maybe just the sound guy and the band. Uh, which actually, uh, okay, so this brings me back to what I was going to ask. All right, Dan, is there anything that bands can do to make life better for the sound guy and or the road manager? Uh, most bands are good about it, but for some bands, for the sound man, depending on the size of the venue, sometimes they need to turn down, which sometimes they're like, no, that's my sound. I got to turn it up but it can make it sound harder in a room if the amps are too loud, depending on the size of the room, depending on the size of the stage in the room, a lot of times it doesn't matter. You just mic it up and deal with it. And other times you need to say, if you bring it down, we can make it sound more even throughout the room. But in terms of for a tour manager, anything I say is like, well, make a plan and stick with it, but that's not good, you know. Don't make, me, don't make me bail you out of jail. <laughs> <laughs> don't make me bail you out of jail after 2 a.m. Tour manager is like a designated adult. You know what I mean? <laughs> Come on, man. You, know you had us go to Disneyland. <laughs> you know what? And there was a time, Dan, was that in like Baltimore where I don't know what we were doing. That drunk girl came out of the place yelling and she started yelling at me. Do you remember this? <laughs> this was a oh, yeah. Of was that at, in front of the hotel or was that? Yeah. Um... And, okay. And it was, so my sister had one too many. Big deal. I don't even know what I did to aggravate her, but she was like yelling at me. And then you came over and you just stood there and you were like, you know what? He is a decent person. Why are you talking to him like that? And she just was like, okay. And just kind of walked away. I, I know that was the first time I ever saw you kind of like maybe raise your voice, but it was to protect me. Thanks. Well, I generally believe in not doing it in front of other people. Like if somebody needs a reprimand or anything like that or an argument with a promoter, I generally will say it'll go better if it's not in front of a group of people. But something like that, you can't help it where you need to just deal with it, you know. Yeah. I was leaving a show in Minneapolis. Somebody attacked our van. So I got out and I swept the leg. It was fine. <laughs> Normally, I wouldn't do that. But <laughs> you do what you have to do sometimes. Or if somebody's running out of band, and they don't look friendly. Sometimes you do do stuff in front of other people, but otherwise, generally, I'm trying to de-escalate and just be calmer, a quieter presence. You know. Yeah. But yeah, well, she's done a good job at that. <laughs> yeah, she was. <laughs> she was. Hey, one of my biggest regrets is we were standing outside my house one time, loading in. Uh, some stuff, and some guy came up, and he saw, he said, hey, you're a guy from Dead Milk, but I saw you, and sounded great, and I should have pointed right to you, and I said, no, we sound good if we're doing all right. That guy makes us sound great, and I still say it to this day. People say, great show. I always go, you see that guy back there? That's why it was a great show. Yeah. Now, you guys play a great show, and that makes, that, you playing a great show makes it easier on the sound man. Oh. You know, Dan, like, you, may, you when, when you started uh, doing sound for us, Maybe it was after the after the first tour, but you requested some extra sound gear, which we got, and we took. Oh yeah, I appreciate that. Because uh, that made it the big red box with the um, outboard. I don't know what were they. Yeah, can, and can we have it we back? Got... <laughs> can we have it back? Now? <laughs> but it, did, it actually did. We got we were get we got compliments on the sound almost every show that you know you guys sound. As good as a record, better than a record. This is great. We got we got reverb, we got really good reverb, good delay, good compressors. Because and that just yeah. made the show really consistently good in Consist each venue as opposed not to not every venue would have that equipment that we played with. Not the venues that we now venues we play these days are pretty well equipped. They're pretty well equipped. I mean, back then there were occasionally you'd go to a venue and and this is no, no put down on this company. But there was a venue that everything they had was PV. The gates were PV. The compressors were PV. The delay was PV. The whole PA was PV. And I was all like, PV makes some good stuff. I had a PV yeah. bass amp that I loved. It was Dave's amp. Well, he, he, had, he had his, and I also had a Black Widow one also. And it was just like, 
the whole thing can't be all PV. It's, well, if you bring in an interior designer to do everything, it's like it'll match. It'll all be PV. It'll all be PV. You know, PV. I was like, you know when you say PV out of context, it's yeah. weird, isn't it? It's PV. Oh, Bumsy, get the PV. <laughs> yeah, but you guys getting that equipment that I requested really did make life a lot easier going to all the different venues, big and small, because I used that same gear, whether we were playing a place for 500 people or a festival for 7,500, that gear came in handy. It was usually less than 500. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, you was... guys played a lot. You got, now people forget, but you guys are playing the same venues as the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Faith No More. Well, because we toured We're on the same bill with them, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's why. It wasn't <laughs> anyway. What that that brings up me to a question. Uh, what what was the biggest tour production that you've been on that you had to handle? Um, one monkeys tour had about thirty three people on the road, including mm -hmm. truck drivers and all the bus drivers mm -hmm. and all the family members that were on the road with us and different background singers and things. So about thirty three people is about the largest. Yeah. There's been a I'm few in the it. 20s, but getting over 30 is like that's a lot of people. And and were you the top? Were you the top? Of, yeah, the I was the overall person? tour manager for that. Actually, the only tour manager for that. Then we had a production manager. There was a monitor engineer. Each two of the monkeys had a personal assistant, but I was the assistant for Michael Nesmith. And there was, you know. I did, I did different things with the monkeys. There were times when I was the tour manager and there were times when I was what they call a producer, but I only did that for one year, like a year and a half. But then- What's going different back, about a producer? I know we're running- Producer is really the manager of the tour oh, okay. and everything. And Andrew Sandoval does that, uh, great guy. He does that and he, he's more, he's better at and better equipped to do things with social media and a whole bunch of other stuff that- I wasn't going to be tweeting stuff or doing all the other stuff that's necessary to do that, you know, and trying to get like a 75 year old guy, you got to tweet something. And I was like, what? Mm -hmm. But I'm not good at that. <laughs> I like also have done different things with the monkeys, and that's why they won't let me back in the Philadelphia Zoo. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, oh. <laughs> hey, hey. Did you get to meet, did you ever get to meet Ringo? I never met Ringo. I've seen him play, but I've never met Ringo. Because it wasn't wasn't Kevin Fahey, our, our merch guy, working for him for a long time? Yeah, I mean, I could have asked, but I just decided not to try and, you know, finagle that, you know. Joe, are you Kevin Fahey did everything. This? This is he gold. did Springsteen, Ringo. He did, you know, the Globetrotters where he got to play and everything. I, I believe Ringo said a few years ago he would not return any fan mail or read it. Maybe he doesn't want to meet anybody new. Maybe he's met everybody he wanted to meet. Eh, he still meets people, but he doesn't want to have to keep dealing with fan mail because he has other stuff, you know. I've got a letter from a Mr. Ted Kaczynski I've been meaning to open for years. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to pop that sucker open. Uh, Dan, I would say I am jealous of you because you, you did meet Grace Jones. Grace Jones in Poland was a great time where she somehow, this sounds terrible, she didn't want to hang out with her band, so she came and hung out with us. It was kind of like, and I, somebody has pictures of that, but it wasn't on my camera. And I, but I, I need to kind of ask people like, hey, where did those pictures end up? But, we're, we're talking about Grace Jones, which means I don't have enough skin left to close my eyes. <laughs> I <don't. laughs> No, she was amazing. She was really yeah, incredible. Brilliant. Actually, one of my favorite musicians ever and completely underrated as somebody who understands songs and, you know, who understood who understood the, what, what was going to be cool and who was into things like, you know, Joy Division and, and uh, um, she, you know, her cover of Walking in the Rain by Flash in the Pan is killer. Okay. Yeah, but she was super. She was actually great. And a great show, too. Great person to hang out with and a great show. I've never seen her live. She's that that would be a that would be a um, a bucket list thing for me. See Grace Jones live, but I see her whenever I close my eyes, which I can't do right now. <laughs> I don't know. 
Hi, oh, all right. I'm going to step back. Ask guys, ask away. I, I have a question. Or uh, can you tell us like your favorite uh, Dave Blood story? Like on tour with him. Wow, <laughs> there's so many. I too many. Just hanging out in Fiesta Key. We had a good time and just doing. I I mean, I off the top of my head, my brain won't come up with anything good. But just really just traveling the world with you guys and with him was just really amazing. And uh, all the goofy places in Philadelphia hanging out, too, where they're watching football in his apartment with a five-inch TV, which he somehow <laughs> thought was cool. You know, when he got rid of his big TV, he had that big TV and he got rid of it. And he had a five-inch TV and he was happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> we just sit around watching, hanging out, doing goofy stuff like that. But but it was good times, good times. Yeah. When when did you move back to Philadelphia? I don't even remember. Me? Yeah. Oh, I came back in uh like eight, in eighty six. I came back in eighty six. Oh, okay. So you, you I was already... in Southern Illinois. I was in Upper Michigan and Southern Illinois. Well, Chicago, Upper Michigan, and then Southern Illinois sales manager with cable tv bringing cable tv to the world yeah that, that's when cable was just was it, it was new and everybody was out. happy to see you and we went you know i managed people who went actually door to door to sell it and then we actually opened up that office in granite city where people could come in and sign up and everything and and then cable got around and i stopped and doing it to you moved back to philly and philly it still didn't have cable yet <laughs> no they were they or tried to pull to this scam because they were they had a for cable TV for Philadelphia, they were trying to do this thing where they were having minorities and people and underrepresented people mm -hmm. involved. Mm -hmm. And they tried to have me be in a picture with the team in Philadelphia and the team oh. in South Carolina. Oh. And it's one of the guys who brother. owned all of these companies were like, wait, you're the same guy. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, you guys are using the same guy in all the photos. Because I was the one guy. <laughs> I remember when you were in Chicago and I thought if he doesn't get off of this road tour he'll never get back on Broadway <laughs> somewhere three theater majors are laughing at that <laughs> but yeah then I was from and I can't, luckily came back and was able to work with you guys and it got me to go do all this stuff is there a tour or an artist that, that's strangest most odd tour or artist or show that you had to deal with? Um, I won't mention the name of an artist who kept their iPad open up to their wife and kid during the show. And luckily it never crashed anything because also part of the show was running off of it. Oh dear. And uh what they were FaceTiming or something the whole Yeah, show. during the whole show. <laughs> yeah, Dan told me that story and I swiped the idea and I did that when we were on tour with Vienna at one point. There was a live show and I was trying to contact her on my because I have the laptop for the yeah. thing. Yeah. But I'm yeah. facing away from the crowd, so yeah. they would never know. But I'm just like, I don't want anything crashing during the show, you know. And um I mean, it, it's, Liz, Liz Fair was quite comfortable talking while she was on the toilet. And the door opened. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't, I won't say anything else. <laughs> I don't think you need to. I, I think we've already sold the plot to that horror movie. <laughs> like, somebody out in LA is like, hello, well, I got one. <laughs> Oh, my God. Well, I'm not going to ask you to cosplay as a Southern gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I start, I can't stop. Uh, you can't stop that. No. So I'm going to back off. And does anybody have anything they want to wrap up with? Or um, I was going to ask um, you, I guess you obviously still enjoy what you're doing. You said you didn't want to stop when you hated it. So you're still doing it. Uh, um, what, what, what would you do in retirement? Travel. Uh, good Grace Jones. Be a secure. <laughs> but no. uh, that's a good question. In terms of figuring out a transition, I don't know. I mean, I'm lucky enough that I'm doing have good stuff, interesting stuff coming up. 
doing Dinosaur Jr. in Hawaii in a few weeks, and Ween's doing some stuff, and Mickey Dolans is doing a Celebrate Monkeys thing. But in terms of retirement, I could sit. <laughs> Have you ever thought of uh, writing a book or making a... Because you, you're famous for taking a lot of candid Polaroid shots and 35 millimeter <laughs> shots. I do uh, love all the photos, but that's a lot of work. And of course. I <laughs> think there's a tour manager, Gus Brandt, who used to, he used to put on dead milkman shows in Pensacola, but he does Foo Fighters and done Cypress Hill and things like that. His book, I would read. My book, I don't know. But <laughs> Gus Brandt's book, <laughs> you can talk Gus Brandt into writing a book. Well, you should, you should, you should, you should project manage somebody else putting your photos and your story together. Get a ghostwriter. I think you that's can do a that. good idea. <laughs> somebody to look through all the photos because I did just find, you know, some photos from. I think it was my first trip to San Francisco with you guys, and you played with Mr. T Experience, and we went to Golden Gate Park. I found pictures of us walking around the park and everything. And a friend from high school came to the show. Of course, it wasn't the show where we had to ride up in a U-Haul truck, but from San Diego, when our van broke down. But <laughs> Remember when our van broke down and we had to, or we, maybe you weren't on that tour. No, you weren't on that, that tour. No, you were on that tour where we had to ride in the van, but it was being towed by the tow truck. <laughs> oh, that was Texas. Oh, we yeah. were about 60 miles outside of Texas. I'm a real. Everything was closing, so nothing could be fixed. So we had the only way to get there. In fact, the guy went home, got his wife and kid, <laughs> and we had to hide in the van because it was illegal, and he rode us to the show. So we actually made the show and everything. We yeah. made the show in Dallas. And then had to get somebody to come out and fix it the next day. Yep, believe it or not, the low budgets got towed to a show in Connecticut once. Yeah, we had a crash. Not from Philly. <laughs> not, not the whole way. No, that's... So, I remember it well. I think Jeff Fox was on that one. We were at the split of thirty-five, and yeah, that was that was the that first time you came out. Down. Huh? That was the first time you came out with us too. I think. I think that was maybe the second tour. The second time, which yeah. uh, oh, the first time might have been with, uh, with Lee Wolf. Lee Wolf, right? You're right. Yeah. The magical Lee Wolf. <laughs> Still hey, friends with some of the people I met through his friends that he introduces to in California and different places in Seattle. Good times. Well, these are very good memories. Yeah, those were bad ones. ones, but some good ones, mostly. Good ones. Oh no, we rode the wave, man. <laughs> Dan, <laughs> I want to wish. I, I want to wish you. I, mean, wish I you slept good luck. on drum kits. I, you know, in that place in uh, West Virginia, or, you know, do, we had been driving so long. I just flopped down on some gear and fell asleep. You know. I was going to say, I want to wish you good luck in Hawaii with Dinosaur Junior because that's the plot of Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> If you had to sum up Jurassic Park, uh, Hawaii, Dinosaur Jr. Dinosaur <laughs> Jr. Oh, wow, you're right. <laughs> I'm always right. <laughs> but thank you. This has been awesome. Thank yeah, you. Thank I, you. I, I, probably my favorite episode, yeah. Man, it's been an honor touring with you guys and being able to do the shows last year. was really incredible. It's like, just really awesome. Maybe Would you ever do another tour with us? Get to do some more this year. Too. <laughs> if you're not That's up to you. <laughs> you have the power. <laughs> Ooh, I got the power. You got the power. <laughs> Are you doing recommendations tonight? You guys do recommendations. Right, Joe? I'll recommend an album by a band called R Ring, and it's called War Poems. War, W A R, War Poems. <laughs> comma, we rested. It's, it might remind you a little bit of the Breeders, but that's because our ring consists of Kelly Deal, who's a founding member of the Breeders, and Mike Montgomery, who owns a recording studio and is a, an awesome musician and a songwriter in his own right. 
and it's their duo project. They hot they got a drummer to play with them and make this album. This is their second album, and I like it quite a bit. It just came out last week, and it's somewhat somber in tone. I think the the war that they're talking about is. It seems to me from the lyrics that it's a could be a, a personal or war with a demon kind of thing, but it's uh it's not it's not like an upbeat party record, but it has its it has a good purpose, I think, and it's it's well made. You can get it on Bandcamp. <clears throat> so should I go next? Yeah, you go next. Um <clears throat> I'm gonna recommend uh if you can watch the monkeys show, uh, yes. a friend of mine at work um, just gave me a, a total now of five volumes of the VHS, and I've been watching it. Um, and I hadn't seen it since I was a kid, and it's it holds up. It's even better than I remember. Um, so yeah, if you've never seen it, watch it. If you have, watch it again. And of course, the music is amazing, always. And uh, the Philadelphia is the Geeter just passed away, and he was on one of the Monkeys episodes. Yeah. Yeah. You with the heater. The Geeter. Geeter with the heater. Geeter yeah. with the heater. Did and you friends have a with Ben Vaughn. And friends with Ben Vaughn, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would like to recommend a YouTube channel that I just discovered. If you're a drummer, you might enjoy this channel. If you're not a drummer, you probably won't enjoy this channel. It's um, uh, it's a, a guy. He's probably in his 40s or 50s. Um, his channel is called Drum.Pizza. I don't know why. Um, but he has uh, some interesting videos about drum history. He has a whole series on the physics of drums, which is very fascinating. And uh, he collects like vintage drums and he um, just talks about stuff. Um, so if you want history, um, it's it's a cool channel. I just started watching it. Um, he's just got a small following right now, but uh, you know we'll see how his channel develops. It's Drum Dot Pizza. Nice. Um, the late Dave Flood, because you asked about a story about him, uh, Dan. The late Dave Flood once took me aside because somebody was getting on his nerves, and he explained to me that the person was artish. And I said, well, I like arty people. And Dave Blood said, well, no, art-ish. The difference between, art, you like arty people. The difference between arty and art-ish is like the difference between childlike and childish. So <laughs> Mona Mur, yes, Burn. that Mona Mur, Mona Mur from the 80s. Mona Mur, who, who actually might be just a little bit older than me, but looks fantastic, is out there kicking ass. She has a new album out and it's called Snake Island. And it is freaking awesome. I've heard our new album, it's not this good. His <laughs> album, I wish our album sounded like this. It's got this weird arty streak in it, but the arty streak doesn't get annoying. It doesn't become art-ish. It's fantastic. You should really hear this album. If I'd heard it last year, it would have been sat at the top of my albums of 2022. It's amazing. There's a single called Shield Wall, but she also does a cover of Ace of Spades. And you oh, wow. This would be, yeah, you think it'd be a bad idea to do an arty cover of Ace of Spades? No, it's my second favorite, and it's just it's just slightly edged out by the original. So Mona Mur, uh is still going strong, and, and bless her. It's an amazing record, and if I get to see her live, I will. Um, also, I'm going to recommend a movie, and that movie is called Metal Lords from 2022. Uh, Dan, I know you like it when I recommend films, so go yeah. check, check this out on Netflix. I cried about 10 times during this film. And it's oh, wow. so one of the funniest comedies I've seen in years. That's how good it is. It is really, really good. There's so many ways this movie could have gone wrong, but it doesn't. It's very clever. And, and I just love every second of it. You're going to want to make sure you watch the pool scene. And I can't say anything else. Uh, yeah, but it's, there's, there, there's, I can't say anything, but yeah, just trust me. Uh, Metal Lords and the Mona Mer uh, Snake Island album. Nice. And Matt, do you have a recommendation for us? A uh, photo book by Pat Sansone from uh, Wilco. And I'm watching, well, I liked Parasite uh, quite a bit. And I'm watching a goofy comedy called The Sex Lives of College Girls by Mindy Kaling. And that was a nice tale. <laughs> <laughs> nice tale. <laughs> 
Thanks. All right, gang. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye. Thanks. Thank you so Thank much, Dave. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. One of my favorite episodes. Thank you. Probably my Thank favorite. Thank you very much. It was awesome. It was really I'll see awesome. you. I'll see you when you bail me out. <laughs> <laughs>